So we've covered a lot of ground in this first section, almost 200 years of colonial history. And we've talked about how the institution of marriage is central to the patriarchal households of this era. But how does this institution change over time from these early uh, 17th century colonies into uh, the American Revolutionary period? Not surprisingly, uh, it changes as the colonial economy changes. So if you think back to 16th century or 17th century Britain, for example, or Spain, land is a scarce commodity in the old European continent. And because it's a scarce commodity, marriage becomes one way of passing down property or affirming land ownership. It's important for young women to marry the right people in order either to obtain property or keep property in the family. The movement to America creates a different set of problems. Of course, when the Puritans first come, they settle in small communities uh, in New England. And there, of course, land is also limited and scarce. But in most of the colonies, including the common law Spanish colonies, land is relatively freely available uh, and certainly much more abundant than it was in Europe. So marriage for the sake of economic consolidation, marriage for the sake of perpetuating the prosperity of a particular family becomes less important. As it becomes less important, of course, young men and women are allowed greater freedom of choice. And it's that greater freedom of choice that begins to encourage imagined conceptions of marriage, romantic conceptions of marriage, which one begins to see already at the end of the 18th century and which we'll see much more of in the 19th century. I think it's interesting uh, for many of us to hear that the idea of romantic marriage is itself a historical concept, that there was a time when marriage was not romantic or not primarily romantic? Not primarily romantic down until the present day or almost until the present day because even at the point when economics was not the major reason for marriage, although it was always a reason for marriage, still marriage was a state or religiously sanctioned sacrament. Uh, which meant that it had to be taken seriously. And since it was a lifetime commitment, not a temporary commitment as we sometimes think of it today, but since it was a lifetime commitment, it also affirmed the status and place of a particular family under the law and within a community. Now, that meant that you know, a, a young woman couldn't be expected to marry a ne'er-do-well no matter how much she romanticized or loved him because, of course, the fate of the whole family was at stake if she did so. So marriage has to be thought of not just as a union between two people, but as a family, a larger family matter. And that persists through much of the 19th and into the 20th century when, of course, it's broken apart by, I think, my generation or the generation that preceded it. And another f facet of this uh, world of colonial marriage is the law of coverture that we've talked about with some of our guest speakers. Does that persist into the present along with these other concerns about marriage? Coverture does persist into the present, although in a much more limited and constrained way than it had earlier existed. But we see remnants of coverture everywhere we look. So, for example, coverture assumed that both the body and the property of women belonged to the man to whom she was attached or legally married. In the 20th century, that principle is rejected, at least in principle, but remnants of it persist. So, for example, wives are not allowed to testify against husbands and husbands against wives because the two are one in the 
Blackstonian law. And testimony of one against the other is like the testimony of oneself against oneself. Uh, so that persists. We also see remnants of the uh, coverture law in elements of pensions, social security, the joint income tax return, all of which are examples of men and women, but particularly women being measured as parts of families rather than as individuals. Indeed, in the mid 20th century, there was a revolt by some women of wealth against the joint income tax return. They claimed that even though their taxes were less under the joint income tax return, they were being treated as parts of their husband's property or parts of his domain. And they wanted them to be measured on their own account, you know, taking into consideration their own wealth and their own property. In other words, they wanted to be treated as individuals. Well, we see women fighting down to this day to be thought of as individuals rather than as members of families or offshoots of families. So the last thing you said speaks to the way in which women are regulated, you might say, in colonial society and well after. On the one hand, they have to be protected to reproduce the family, both biologically and socially. Um, they have to be placed in institutions of marriage that will protect them. And at the same time, uh, their choices, their property, their labor is policed, is, is regulated by the institution of coverture, by the patriarchal household. It is worth actually thinking about how uh, the protection of women runs like a thread through American history. And that protection is at the same time what prevents us from seeing women as uh, entrepreneurial spirits in every sense of that word. So what coverture does is to instill protection in the marriage bond. Protective labor legislation in the early 20th century contends that women nevertheless need to be protected and if they can't be protected by marriage, they need to be protected by the state. So there is a way there in which the state assumes the role of the husband, if you like, in protecting women. And when women try to escape from that kind of protection, they are, of course, told and sometimes convinced that the protection is good for them, that they, are, that they benefit from state regulation or state policing. We'll see when we get to the 21st century how that expectation actually disadvantages women.